Everybody, let's give a huge hand for Michael Paul. Before I get started, a lot of people have been asking how I got this, this dent across my nose. Um, actually, look, it looked like a week ago, so it's not as bad as it was. Um, but over the last week or so, I've been building a haunted house. I do it every year um, for the kids. And this year, my first major accident, I had a two pound staple gun fall down and smack me on the edge of the nose. <laughs> um, yeah, it made my eyes water. Um, <laughs> Lights out didn't cuss, but that was a lie. Uh, actually, this year, my daughter said, So, what are you going to be this year, Dan? This year I'm going to be a, I, Halloween's a big deal to me, I know it's a fun on Halloween. Um, it's, the, it's the one time a year you're allowed, you're allowed to make kids cry. That's, <laughs> that's the way I look at it. Um, so this year I'm going to be a homicide lax wielding maniac. And my seven year old daughter's like, can you say that again? I said, kill her. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Alright, so um, I'm going to talk about... Uh, it's funny, when I was asked to do this, do this presentation, what, what am I going to write about? I want to write something different, something new. Um, I could talk about an SDL, but I'm sure you've all seen an SDL presentation at some point. Um, you know, I could show you some stats, I'm sure you've seen some stats at some point. So I figured I'd do something that's a little bit irreverent and a little bit different, which is based on a lot of the stuff that I've learned along the way um, while working at Microsoft uh, on software security. So, um, just a little bit about, about me. Uh, if you want to email me, please go ahead. I'm quite happy to take email. And, uh, if you have any questions or comments on uh, Microsoft, uh, it feels like forever, 18 years. What's interesting about 18 years though is that for the first, oh, I don't know, six or seven of them, but even though I've always been involved in security, it was for a while um, security features. So a lot of stuff that you see in Windows NT, in the old days of Windows NT, um, like uh, uh, said actors, privileges, tokens, all those stuff, all that kind of stuff, crypto, firewall, blah, 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 blah. Um, that sort of stuff that I was involved in the very early days. But it's all about security features. And then, um, close to like a dozen years ago, um, a small group of us splintered away from the Windows group. When I say a small group, two people, uh, me and one other guy, splintered away from the Windows group to focus on security as in threats. So there was secure software as opposed to security software. And it's a very, very different mindset. Um, our group now is uh, well north of 150 people. Um, and so there's a lot of people involved like, in the, uh, the security processes of uh, Microsoft. Um, as uh, Nishi mentioned at the beginning, I uh, wrote a couple of books along the way. Um, actually, most recently, 24 Game of Sims, uh, which David LeBlanc and John Yeager uh, refreshed just recently. So with that, then I'm going to move on to the, the core um, Death. I really only have one goal here, and that is, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I will be a little bit irreverent as I go through this, but anyone who knows me, that's not just the way I am. I don't mean to offend anybody, uh, so don't be offended. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just, I want you to sort of learn some of the things that we have learned. It's all very easy. things pushed on you that are not based on real world experience. It's all very well if someone says, you, know, you should be doing this. It's like, well, have you actually done that? Well, no, but you should be doing this. And it's a classic do as I say, not as I do. Um, I'm going to tell you some things here you know, that we've done, um, and some of the things that have failed, and some of the things that have worked, some of the things that we've learned along the way. So really what I'm trying to sort of impart here is these are things that you can sort of start learning and using tomorrow. Uh, or in some cases, not doing it tomorrow. Uh, I'll talk about some of the things that have, that have actually uh, kind of gone wrong over time. So here are the things that I've learned. You know, this is just the agenda. I'm going to go straight to the guts of this whole thing. The first one, I'm a huge believer in, and that is that there is nothing sacred about security. There's nothing special about security. And it really annoys the heck out of me when we treat security as a special thing that only the high priesthood of security understand. And if you have a security problem, you go to the high priesthood and they tell you how to do it right. They've never done it, they've never done it, never done it themselves, but they tell you how to do it right. They don't tell you how to do it, well, they tell you that things are broken and go and fix it. But security people are really bad at telling you how to fix it correctly. But if you screw it up again, they'll gladly tell you that you screwed it up again. 
they'll gladly tell you that you screwed it up again. And security people are just like that. And so there really is nothing special about security. We need to change security from being this specialized skill to being something that people, all people are cognizant of. And let's be perfectly frank, you're building stuff today, it's going to be hooked up to the web. Or it's going to be on a mobile device. It's immediately accessible <coughs> to a very large population of unscrupulous users. And people need to understand that. Now I'm not saying you need to turn everyone into a security expert. That's not true at all. But you need to raise the bar. And you need to get everyone's head in the game with this. And a really good example of this, in fact, the, the reason why I sort of came up with this phrase, and the reason why it's in quotes, is in the very early days of, um, just after the Bill Gates memo, we started these things called security pushes, which is essentially, okay, stop what you're doing, everyone go back through education, because we assume you know nothing about software security, and you go and do, look, look for bugs, build your test plans, build your threat models, and so on. Well, I was in charge of all the developers in Windows in the, in the early days of the uh, Windows security push. So I had every single developer in, in Windows. And we would always kick them off with the vice president kicking it off. In my case, I always had Rob Short. Now, Rob was the, an Irish guy who, had, who was the vice president of the base, which is basically the kernel down to the metal. He was in charge of all that stack, that tiny stack, the very important stack. And he said, you know, in, I'm not, I'm not going to remove ex expletives from the, his comments. Um, but he basically said, bleep, bleep, security, nothing special, bleep, I don't understand why bleep is so bleeping bleep to some people. <laughs> but basically it was, there's nothing special about security. You know what? Rob was not a security guy. He was a kernel guy. But he knew then there's nothing special about it. And we need to get past this whole point of going to the high priesthood and they'll tell us, They'll bless us with you know, what the, the, the correct solution is. We need to get beyond that. Uh, people ask me, you know, how many developers do you have in Windows? How many security developers do you have in Windows? And without batting an eyelid, 6,000. Because that's how many developers are on Windows. Now, are they all security alpha geeks? Heck no. Thank goodness, we'd never ship anything. <laughs> They're not security alpha geeks. But they know at least the basic. I mean, I used to joke. Going from my office down to the cafeteria, which normally should be like a six minute walk, usually takes me 30 minutes. Because people are always stopping along the way and say, hey, what do you think about this idea? You know, what do you think about this threat? Or well, what do you think about this idea? By the way, the threats that we thought about are this. The moment, the moment these people start thinking in those, in those ways, just normal developers, you're going to really do miraculous things. You don't need to turn everyone into a security expert. You just need to raise at least a bar to get things going. Which really leads me quite nicely into my next um, observation, which is get to a baseline. That, that baseline, by the way, is above zero. <laughs> so in terms of level of expertise, yes, there is a zero baseline. But we don't want that. To so get to something that's above zero. Again, you're not trying to turn everyone into a security <coughs> expert. Now, one thing that we have found is across Microsoft, and that's other companies that we've dealt with, there's all of a sudden some people across the organization who become sort of security impassioned and they sort of take on the mantle of security for their group. We see that happen all the time. They think the security is like this, this cool thing, something new. And so you need to get security, security expertise to above zero. And the way you do that is, is partly through education. Um, we went through this m massive uh, education push years ago, and we continue to, 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 to revisit this uh, every year or so, but the whole point is keeping everyone on top of what the current issues are. Again, you're not trying to turn everyone into a security expert, you just want to get to, to something that's not zero. And when you have people stopping you in the hallways saying, hey, let's go back 10 years. 10 years ago, people would stop me in the hallway and say, hey, what do you think of this? My reply would be, it's insecure. Today, it's, what do you think of this idea? And by the way, here are the threats we're concerned about. It's all of a sudden, the, the number of times I say to people, it's, you, know, you need to rethink that design or that bit of code or whatever, has diminished to almost zero. So a lot of the really easy, low-hanging fruit is kind of gone. Because people themselves do most of the work before coming to you for the really hard problems. And I like that, because that scales. It scales very, very well. The other thing I want to point out is it's very important that you have domain-specific training. 
what I mean by that is don't go to your, uh, okay, I'm a Microsoft guy, I mean, don't go to Windows with some Office-like training, right? They're going to fall asleep. Because we're not Office, we're Windows. And a good example of this was Xbox. Right? So Xbox are a very strong group, they're a very strong engineering team. Very, very strong. Excellent, excellent guys. And so I had this training, I was talking to their main security guy, and I was sort of bouncing around with him, and he's like, nah, change that slide, change that slide, change that slide, change that slide. You're basically going to make it Xbox-esque. You've got to change the terminology to Xbox terminology. I even had like a little brainwave, I just put a picture of my game attack, my Xbox game attack on the front slide. So all of a sudden, one of them. Serious, I know it sounds really lame and pathetic, but all of a sudden, I'm one of them. And when you come to dealing with the Xbox team, that's a big deal. So you, the, the, the presentation has to be domain specific. We could actually another good example, real simple one. In Windows, executables end in .exe, right? .exe. On Xbox, they don't. They end in .xex. So anyway, I made a reference to you know spoofing an .exe, like spoofing an .exe. There's little things like that. So make it very domain specific. Understand what environment. You know, people are going to be deploying their application and you change the training for that environment. So waste of time going to the Windows Mobile guys with a Windows 7 slide deck. Different threats. Totally different threats. Different compilers. Different CPUs. You've got to make it domain specific. That way you keep their interest if nothing else. You can't dip your toes in late secure. What that means is you can't say, oh crap. Um, it's the end of the month and we have some money left, left. let's spend it on some security training. Or, um, you know, I think we found a few bugs recently, let's fix a few and then we'll be secure. Or let's spend the next couple of weeks finding and fixing some security bugs and then we're done. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. You've got to change the way you develop software. Current development techniques just don't work. If they did, we wouldn't be in the pickle we're in right now that the industry is in. And so, when we were started on this journey of the SDL, and this very, very long journey, um, we really had three options. Option number one was do nothing and hope the problem goes away. Well, that's not going to happen. Option number two was completely rip out our development processes that we presently have and start again. That's not going to happen because we've never, I can almost guarantee we sit around a table right now saying, so when are we going to ship this new development process? We can't do that. And so what we do is take something that's very pragmatic, I believe, take the, the current development processes in Microsoft, whether they're something as big as Windows, or something as small, by small I mean development increments. Let's say something as small as say Windows Live, um, they, those guys may develop every, you know, ship something every 40 days. So it's important that the process, the process uh, infuses security requirements and tasks into the current development process uh, that you have in place. You can't just rip and replace. It just, it just, it's just not pragmatic. At the end of the day, you've got to, you've still got to ship software. So uh, augmenting with the current life cycle is absolutely the way to go uh, from what we've discovered so far. I can't stress this enough. Executive support is absolutely critical. Our group, when we started out, okay, it was a tiny little group, we made some progress. But we were working very much with individual feature teams or product groups on a very small, sort of isolated basis. For example, we may work with the networking group in Windows, or we may work with the HTML rendering team in IE, or we may work with the ISA KMP guys. I mean, we'd be very, very small directed tasks that we would do. And what we would do is have these things called, called bug bashes, which is we start up in the morning, security education, tell me what's required of them, and then we'd have to go look at the bugs, uh, building test plans, building new test plans, or building puzzles, or getting fuzzers, or whatever it was, and then filing bugs. And then at the end of the day, we'd have competition, like what you know, was the lamest bug, what was the, who found the most bugs, who found the most severe bug that was created by the most senior person at Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> it was the doozy. That was the fiesta resistance. 
<laughs> Whoever got that one, that was a gold star award. Especially the guy with the VP. It happened exactly once. I'm not going to name names. It happened exactly once. It was like a 12 year old boat. It was like really, really obscure. And it was a guy who was president of now, a VP of Microsoft at the time. So, anyway, um, that works to a point, but you're not going to influence the product as a whole. All you do is looking for bugs, essentially, which doesn't, doesn't help. It actually doesn't help. By the way, those who are not aware, we, we have you know, details about that essentially the more bugs you find in a product before you ship, the more bugs you'll find after the product ships. Now, okay, that doesn't mean sit on your hands and do nothing so you find no bugs before you ship. It doesn't mean that at all. It means make a concerted effort. Obviously, do normal stuff. But if you find like thousands and thousands and thousands of bugs right before you ship, you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of bugs after you ship. So fixing bugs is not a sign of... Progress? I'm lost for words, actually. It's not really a sign of anything positive. Uh, it's, it's just not. People say, you know, we're, we, we rock, we fix a thousand bugs. Like, no, you don't. You really don't. So people have asked me many times, so what do we do? So well, don't write crappy code in the first place. And, you know, there's times when people have actually looked at the code, it's like, you know what, we, there's just too many bugs in this code, trash it and start again with new methodologies, you know, with new mindsets, with new tool sets, with new expectations of that code. It's so important. So just the point I'm trying to drive at here is that if you are doing this in a wholehearted manner, you may impact the product life cycle, the product cycles in the early days. And as it becomes sort of more entrenched in the organization, it will become easier and easier and easier to do. But go to my first bullet point, so there's nothing special about security, it's just about part of getting the job done. Right? So it becomes part of the process. Well, we found in many, many groups that the testing time literally started to shrink. Because of the SDL, we front end so much of the requirements, we ban so much bad functionality, we have some, some good tooling up front, that basically ends up being less work for the testers. But you can only do all this stuff if you have the exec ports off on this. There comes a point where you've got to go to the top and say, look, we need to do this stuff. Here are the threats. Here's the potential threat to the business or to our customers or to our organization, whatever. And we have to do this. And that can be an interesting exercise. Um, one of the turning points at Microsoft was, uh, was in 2001. You know, we had no code red, we had no the and obviously it was 9-11. Um, David LeBlanc and I had written writing secure code, um, mainly because we're sick of answering the same questions every day. So let's just write a book, we get everyone to, to read, and then we'll answer the hard questions. Um, and we had a meeting um, with Gates in December, the first week of December. At the same time, the .NET, the .NET team hadn't shipped .NET 1.0 yet. They hadn't shipped it yet. But they found a small number of security bugs. They were really concerned. So what we ended up doing was having this thing called the .NET Security Standard, which is November, December. The whole point, and this is where the, the whole security push, the concept of a security push started, where you start what you're doing, education, you tell the, the developers, the designers, and the testers what they need to do, the documentation people, what they need to do, and you have them go do it. And you're done when you're done. You're not done at some arbitrary date, you're done when you're done. Now, those of you who ever remember back, back in the day, Prior to release candidate one, ASP.NET ran in system context. You may remember post RC1, it didn't. Why? We said, like, no, you, you can't ship this way. And the debugger guy is like, well, we have to because you can't debug it, you know, ASP.NET properly unless you run in system context. Like, don't care. <laughs> you know, don't care. Really? I mean, seriously? You want every machine that has a bug in it to be a potential system level executable or exploit? No. So we changed it. Sure, it caused some debuggers to fail working. But let's be brutally honest. I mean, the population of people debugging an app, an ASP.NET app, is that. The population of users running that system is that. At the end of the day, you've got to make that, deci got to make that decision, right? What's the biggest population of customers you've got to protect? To be perfectly honest with you, the people in that slither of the population you can give them the steps. 
Right? They can understand the steps to be able to debug properly. They can if they're running a debugger. But your normal user, they can't. So um, we had the .NET security stand there with this meeting with Bill and um, uh, Craig Mundy being worked on this thing. They end up becoming trustworthy computer. And so all these things all kind of align. And that's really what sparked a lot of, uh, a lot of Bill's uh, interest in this and why he, he sent the memo out um, in January the following year. Deprecate all functionality. This is something I'm always, I'm, I'm always writing people, give me a list of the things you want to kill. Give me a list of all those features you want to kill. Um, the performance guys actually like it too, right? Because the less crappy old stuff you have running, the less memory you use, and so on. So the performance guys, by the way, actually, there's something not in here, but something else you should, should think of is build alliances with other people in your organization. Right? So killing this, this stuff, the performance guys love it. Fixing security bugs in general, the reliability guys love it. Right? Because there's a very, very close correlation between the two. In fact, I'll cover that in the very, very last slide as well. Uh, the privacy guys, well, that's a no-brainer. The compliance guys, that's a no-brainer too. So try and build alliances because you'll need them at some point. Uh, so deprecate all functionality. I'm a huge believer in this. Uh, you know, old software was written in a day when there were different threats, totally different threats. The software was never built with future threats necessarily in mind. It was built with old technology, old tooling, um, an old mindset, and so on. And we're always looking at how we can deprecate functionality moving forward. But it's hard. It's actually easy if no one uses your feature. That's easy. But if you know, if you feature the very, very common feature, that becomes really hard. Um, one of my favorite examples is, uh, is X, like it's not really deprecating functionality, it's still there, but it's off by default, and that's XP underscore command shell and SQL Server. That's off by default. It's not deprecated, but the main functionality in the SQL Server that required it no longer was re-engineered, so it didn't require XP underscore command shell. By the way, does anyone know why XP underscore command shell was enabled by default in SQL Server for such a long time? There's actually a okay reason. Replication wouldn't work. So I'm like, well, what happens if I don't use replication? I have a nice single database. Well, XP underscore command shell is still there. So now it's off by default. Uh, another good example is in Windows Vista, we um, got rid of the network stuff. Who actually knows of a, a network, <coughs> network running IPXS people? I, other than a test environment at Microsoft, I know of none. So that got deprecated. It was actually kind of interesting because we had a vulnerability in the network client, but it didn't affect Windows Vista customers and beyond. Why? Because the software wasn't there. And it was a critical vulnerability too. So deprecating functionality is actually very, very easy for servers. You just turn everything off. You, just, you, know, you, can, you can deprecate almost to, to your heart's content. Because generally the user is a, is a somewhat savvy user. But for client platforms, it's one heck of a lot harder. It's a lot harder because generally the user is not so savvy. And you then run up, run, up, run up against the sort of usability, annoying your customers, and the security problem. Um, by the way, the reason why they sometimes deprecate stuff is because the code is so old and so crusty. You know, no one really even understands the code anymore. You know, the last guy to touch it is now working on Xbox. He doesn't care. Um, you know, so you've got to be very careful about some of these things. You may just decide that the best solution is just to kill it. Just kill the feature. Reduce friction. Um, your average developer or engineering type in general is absolutely not a security expert. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think they should at least have security expertise, as I said in the slide number two. But they're not going to be security experts. So you need to make things as easy as possible for them. And that really revolves around the tools. You've got to automate as much as possible. That doesn't mean, I want to point this out, that doesn't mean you can abdicate all responsibility to the tools. That is not true at all. You should never do that. You should always use tools to augment the process, make things easier. So for example, real simple examples. Um, we have static analysis requirements in Microsoft. Okay? They run the moment you check the code in. They run automatically. It finds a bug, you've got one or two problems. Either there's a bug in your code or a bug in the tool. Regardless, something gets fixed. Um, things like band functionality. 
So, for example, stir coffee, stir cap, stirring coffee, stirring cap, aspirin tap, get taps, and all that evil brethren. Your compile will actually fail. If you guys use any of, those fu any of those functions, your compile will fail with a compiler error. So, you've got to go and fix it. So, the, the point there is it's better to do it at the point of compilation rather than six months later when someone does a scan of the source code and finds 17,000 banned APIs in the code base. Or, you know, banned uh, use of MD4, MD5, SHA1, DES, um, RC4. Okay, we banned all those. Uh, weak, um, weak key sizes. And they happen very close to the compilation step. Very close. Not at the point of compilation, but very, very close. Yeah? Have you guys had to deal with, with languages that don't want themselves to static analysis? Like, I, mean, I guess maybe you have JavaScript, but you know, our, our challenge is quite not really. Right, so the, the question is, um, you, know, you have problems with uh, tools that don't really lend themselves to static analysis. Well, there's still, there's still dynamic analysis as well, right? Uh, which can monitor the runtime behavior. Um, but even then, there's some stuff that you can do, um, like band functionality. I mean, uh, you know, in, in Perl, you can do an analysis of, of taintedness. You can make it a requirement. Thou shalt taint, you know, income, untrusted income, uh, uh, in, untrusted, um, untrusted input. Um, JavaScript's interesting. We're seeing people think more about JavaScript. I don't know about you guys, but JavaScript today is not your father's JavaScript. I do not understand JavaScript. I don't. I do not understand JavaScript anymore. And that means stay, stay the hell away. I'm not going to touch JavaScript. There are people who are way more competent than me on JavaScript. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, don't build static analysis or any kind of tool for a language you don't understand. Um, but the question, but again, the, the point there is that's actually, if there are languages or environments that don't lend themselves to any kind of analysis at all, that's a real problem. That's a real problem. Because the other cool thing about analysis is it can also lead to just-in-time education. But what do you, like, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I write call code that calls processes relatively rarely, perhaps once or twice a year, perhaps. And then Windows is an API called create a process. I always, always forget there's, there's two handles that are returned, or two blocks that are returned after call, call create a process. I always forget to release them. Every time. I always forget. Now, if I wrote create process stuff every day, I would remember. When I, when I go to compile it, the, tools, the, the, the compilation tool says, hey, memory link, handle link, here. So, forgot about that. Yeah, go on, and then I'm going to clean it up again. So it's just in time learning that I get every, every year. <laughs> um, eventually, I will remember. <laughs> like, I will remember, don't put staples on top of ladders when you move moving ladder. <laughs> um, so tools are absolutely critical. Uh, I can't stress it enough. <coughs> they do find bugs. Um, Gary McGraw has a nice saying, which is you can use these kinds of things as, as like a bad misometer. So if you've got like a thousand lines of code and a thousand lines of code, and you've got to review one or the other, you, you, you only got a few hours, and you want to re review one of them but not the other, which do you review? Best thing to do is take your analysis tool and compile them both. And whichever has the most warnings is probably the worst code. Probably. But I, always I like to compile code at warning level 4 if it's C or C++. And see the warnings that come out. Because it's almost impossible to write code, uh, C or C++ code the first time around, that compiles clearly at warning, clearly at warning level 4. Um, so if you find like, code that has no warnings at warning level 4, Actually, I'm suspicious <laughs> when that happens. Um, I've seen instances where people have to shut warnings up, uh, told the compiler to be quiet. Um, I've seen that once. But on the whole, if you have code that compiles clean at that level, you've got pretty good code compared to the other thousand lines that had, you know, 23 issues. I'm going to spend most of the time on that 23 issues code. Um, better libraries. There are certain. Well, there's a few ways of thinking about this. The, the first one is, when it comes to low-level C and C++ stuff, low-level stuff, the C runtime is very, very old. And, you know, it's really crusty. It's highly insecure. There are lots of functions that are very easy to call that are just, are just bad. And they should never be used that way. Um, so you should be using better, better libraries there. Um, they're available all around the place. Uh, we include them in Visual, Visual Studio uh, 
Visual C++ as well. I read a book just recently that um, was talking about C++, and basically they were saying in the book, look, don't use the low-level C memory manipulation functions. Use the higher-level C++ constructs. If you're writing C++, use, use the higher-level constructs. Don't use the low-level goop. It's just not worth, worth it. So that's another example of, of, uh, of better libraries. And finally, updated compilers. This is something that I am really passionate about, and I spend a lot of time, we're talking about building bridges. We have very, very strong bridges to the developer division within Microsoft. Now, these are the guys that do you know, C Sharp, uh, C++, um, Visual Studio, so on. And um, we're always coming up with new defenses, and we put them back into the compiler, because sometimes the compiler is the best place to put the defenses. A really good example of this, and I actually wrote about this in the SDL blog a few years ago, but there was a vulnerability in IE that was critical on every single platform except on Windows Vista and later, even though the bug was there. The bug was actually an integer overflow calling operating new while parsing VML objects. And the bug was there in Windows Vista. But the worst you would get is a dust, the browser would crash. That's all you would get. But prior to Windows Vista, it was actually a remote code execution, by a drive-by remote code execution. What you had to do is have a malforms, um, uh, no, it was SVG uh, object on a web page, go load it, that's it, bang, you know, own. Now the reason why Vista customers were protected was because we'd added something to the compiler. And what we were doing is we were automatically detecting integer overflow calling operator new. And we're going to go into all the code in details. But basically, we detected that, that situation at runtime, and we just killed the process. Because you, you just overflow a, memory, a, a, dynamic memory, a dynamic memory allocation function. You've just overflowed it. Any value I give back to you right now is completely bogus. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to die. Dying is better than running code. It sucks, but it sucks less. And I'm a big believer in sucking less. <laughs> the only time, seriously, the only time, okay, the reliability guys don't like it, but in this case, they can shut the heck up. We don't care. We were, what would you rather have, a remote code execution or a DOS? The only time the security and reliability guys have truly been at odds over a security feature or something that was a DOS was for um, common, common criteria back in the, in the good old days, C2 compliance in Windows NT, you had to set the security event log so they would actually bug check the box if the security event log fills up, right? Because if the security event log fills up, you can't log any more events. <coughs> Therefore, bug check the box, blue screen the box, with a friendly hex code at the time to signify that the event log is full. But, all things considered, you know, we, we had a lot of defenses to our compilers, and we see GCC are doing a similar thing as well, uh, especially for, for buffer overrun uh, kind of attacks. Uh, where we'll turn a, a, a code execution vulnerability into a DOS, where the application will just quit. By the way, this is something you should be aware of. There are some situations where quitting is absolutely, by the way, when I say quitting, I mean the shortest amount of code between the event happening and you getting out of dodge, the shortest amount of code possible. It's often a good idea, if you're in a situation where in a, criti in a security critical operation and you're in an inconsistent state, it's often better just to die. A good example of this was some code that I saw, luckily got fixed before we shipped, where some guys were generating a key using CryptGen random in Windows, which is cryptographically random, and if it failed, they called RAND. Which isn't it? This was, this, this was the old days, by the way. They're all old days. <laughs> and I said, you can't do this. And so well, what happens if it fails? If it fails, you crash the operation, you die. If you cannot, if you don't have, the only time crypto random will fail is if there is not enough entropy. If you don't have enough entropy, you shouldn't be generating keys. Die. You can't continue the operation. You can pop up a dialog box and said, hey, Wait while I collect, you know, move the mouse around a bit. <laughs> then click OK, try again. Um, you could try that, but the, 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 the fix was literally exit process. You know, pop a dialog, die. We, we can't do this operation right now, try, try later. Um, 
So don't be too worried about DOSs, you know, over insecurity critical operations. It may be the right thing to do, rather than continuing in an insecure or an unknown manner. Threat modeling can drive the rest of your process. I'm a huge believer in this. Um, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit right now that the very early threat modeling stuff that we had at Microsoft was almost incomprehensible unless you were a security geek. And I take full blame for that. Completely full blame for it. Basically, unless you had a security expert in the room, you were pretty much doomed to failure. Um, but now it's a point where it's actually pretty streamlined. Now, in the old days, it was all about just understanding the threats to the software, which is a good thing. But it's more than that. It also helps you understand your attack surface. How much of the application is opened up to the world for attack? It helps you understand what areas you need to prioritize when it comes to doing things like code review, or fuzz testing, or just testing in general. It can help drive a lot of that. So I'll give you a quick, quick example. And this is just a you know, brain dead example, a simple example. You've got like a client process, talking to a server process, over this trust boundary, which is the internet. Basically, anything going across that boundary in either direction, we really don't trust. Um, and then it communicates with, uh, the server process communicates with some application data, data store, and uh, configuration data, data store. Obviously, really, really simple. But there's a whole bunch of questions that you can ask yourself here. Um, so we have a thing called Stride, which is essentially a more fine-grained <laughs> attacker's perspective on CIA. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those are security properties that you want. Stride, I'll explain it in a minute, is a bit more fine-grained, but it's looking from an attacker's perspective. So S is spoofing. I want to spoof you. Um, T is tampering. It's the opposite of integrity. Uh, I want, my, as an attacker, I want to, change, I want to attack you. I want to, I want to um, tamper with the data. Repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. So if you have any data flowing across, like a wire or something, it's subject to tampering. I can tamper with that data. It's also subject to information disclosure. I can view the data. It's also subject to denial of service. Now, because there's some data flowing between these two endpoints, one of the first questions I'm going to ask you is, so do you care? There is a tampering threat there. There's absolutely a tampering threat. Do you care? And the answer may be, no, don't care. That's fine, write down in the threat model, don't care, Bob says so, and here's the reason why. Capture that data, not so you can fire Bob six months later when it turns out he was wrong, but the whole point is you've got to capture those assumptions. We assume, hate me sentences it starts with that, we assume that that's never going to happen. That's fine, Bob says this will never happen because Bob drinks at lunch. I mean, <laughs> just capture that data, it doesn't matter, just capture the data. Because it's amazing when, when you know, Three years from now, people say, crap, why did we not protect that channel? We don't know. It's lost in the mist of time. But at least you can go back to the threat and say, well, Bob said this, and what he said was actually valid back then. But it's not valid now. Um, the subject of information disclosure, you can view the data. Again, do you care? I mean, a good example of this, right, is say um, a bank site with mortgage rates, or a mortgage company with mortgage interest rates. Do you care about the information disclosure threat? Do you care about who can view that data? Probably not, right? If it's on Citigroup's website and they're doing mortgages, they want every man and his dog to read the, those mortgage interest rates, I, I guess. Do you care about tampering them? Heck yeah. But wouldn't that be fun? You know, change Citigroup's mortgage interest rates from 3.9% to 2.9%. That would be hilarious. So you may, not, you may not care about the tampering threat, so you may not care about the information disclosure threat, but you do care about the tampering threat. Um, and again, you can walk through all these things, and the cool thing is that the, the threat modeling tool that we have, as long as, you, as long as the diagram is correct, we will fill in all these blanks for you. And then you can actually fill in whether it's important, why, and, what the, and most, most importantly, if it is important, what the mitigation is. And sometimes someone will say, that's not a good mitigation. Here's why. But you've got to capture that data. It's so important that you capture that data. So just to sort of stress a little bit more, you know, how is this channel protected? If at all, it may not be protected. Um, you know, now that we're seeing uh, 
you know, attacks against unprotected Wi-Fi networks that people go to Facebook and Twitter and so on over non-SSL channels, you know, that threat kind of changed a little bit last week. But that's the whole point, right? Yeah, threats change from week to week. You know, what? Well, not a threat today, maybe a threat tomorrow. Um, you know, I make jokes. People say, "Oh, you know, that's you know, as far as we know, that's secure. That might change tomorrow." But right now, everything we know about that, that's good to go. But don't quote me on that tomorrow. Um, same so when it comes to connecting to the server, how does a client app know it's the correct server? How do you know that's Amazon.com, not Baghdad Bob's Bookshop? How do you know that? Um, What's the authentication level that's required for that connection? Is it anonymous? Is it like a user level? Or is it like an admin level connection? Uh, what about network accessibility? Is it local, subnet, totally remote? What is it? And the real beauty of this, the last, the last two ones, these help you understand your attack surface. Because you may have some central component that has like five <coughs> connections coming in. And you may see that, wow, you know, three of them are anonymous and remote accessible, but only one of them is like really critical. The other two, we, really, we should probably authenticate who's connecting. The other one, yeah, it's okay. The other two, we should really know who's connecting here. We're going to require authentication. Immediately, you, re you, you reduce the number of people who can attack those two endpoints and the code behind it from being the planner to being a bunch of people who have passwords on your site. There's a lot fewer people. Um, I'm a huge believer in attack service reduction. Uh, massive believer in it. Uh, time and time and time again at Microsoft we've seen this. So a really good example of what I'd like to, to, to explain is, uh, is the SASA work. So SASA did not affect Windows Server 2003, even though the coding bug was there. No, there was no any changes around the code anywhere. The code was exactly the same as the code in Windows 2000. Windows 2000 was susceptible to SASA. And what it was, was, a, it was an, an anonymously accessible RPC endpoint available on the internet essentially, which meant the SASA could propagate quite nicely, right? Anonymous, remotely accessible. Anyone from anywhere on the planet can access that endpoint, in theory. During the development of Windows Server 2003, part of the security push stuff that we did was, let's go and look at all the networking endpoints, every single one. Let's measure them, name pipes, sockets, UDP, TCP, you name RPC endpoints. For every single one, find out who owns the code behind that, march into their office, close the door, and say, explain why this is accessible to the world. And we found this one endpoint, we said, that should really only be admin at the keyboard. So it's essentially an LPC endpoint. So we changed it, we put an access check on there to make it a local only endpoint, and only admin. So to actually infect a Windows Server 2003 machine with SASA required you to be an admin physically at the keyboard, which is the least, SASA is the least of your worries at that point. <laughs> so the whole point is the bug was still there, but Windows Server 2003 users didn't have to apply a patch, at least not an urgent patch, because there was no need to, the bad guys couldn't access the airport. Next one is security, there's not, yeah. Before you move on, like from, from your kind of experience, what's the ballpark training time that it takes for people to really get being able to do threat modeling on the run? So I've tried a couple of hours, four hours, and it doesn't seem uh, really take it. You know, if I was half smart, I would have brought Adam Show Stacks. I've got a whole oh, the I've got a whole box of them, man. They've been in my cupboard. The yeah. They've been in my cupboard for, for months now. <laughs> um, we kind of kind of take. Um, <laughs> We should actually brought that, because that's actually the simplest way of introducing people to how to threat model. It's not a structure to a tool, but it introduces you to the terminology and the wording and the, the, the thinking behind it. Now the question is, does it work? Yes, it does work. Is it as structured as a threat modeling tool? Heck no. But it still works. Um, yeah. I agree with you, it still works for the calls that you have control of control that you have. But I think the challenge is when you reuse components and build bigger systems, what actually the correct diagram is. Yeah, so that's a really that's a good point. Is um, you know, essentially third party components. So we have a name for that. Uh, it's giblets. It's stuff that you depend on that you don't control. No, no, there's 
this is something else. Can someone like email me add giblets to the slide there? Um, <laughs> you bring up a really important point, and it took us a while to get a handle on this because it all of a sudden became obvious. So the real wake up call for this was Slam. We all of a sudden realized that a whole bunch of product, because SQL Server itself really wasn't that effective. It actually wasn't. What was effective was MSDE, which is the developer edition, the desktop edition that was free of charge that you could actually include with your application. So people needed some good high power backend storage for their app, they would ship MSDE. It's a giblet, right? So if you have some accounting software, you ship to MSDE, you have this component that you that's critical to the application that you don't control. That's a problem. But it's, it's a problem if that component has no service in plan. So my advice to you is if you have a whole bunch of third-party components, you need to go to the third-party component providers and say, what's your servicing plan for these components? Because if there, if there is no servicing plan for these components, I would recommend right now, especially if you've got something with a high exposure, i.e. the internet, you've got to have an exit strategy. You, you have to. You just have to. But you're right. But the whole point about the threat modeling tool at that point is if you have a component you don't know a lot about, it's like essentially a black box, you've got to put those assumptions in the threat model. We assume this component does this. We assume this component doesn't send sensitive information to somebody else. Those kinds of things. You've got to put those assumptions in there. You have to. And again, if you have a component that you use that you have no clue what the services model is, you've got to get an exit strategy. You've got to. Would that exit strategy be a good resume? Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't mean for you. I don't mean for, I don't mean for that. Oh, yeah, it's real. It's sort of interpreted wrong. Um, no, a good exit strategy for that component to replace it with another component that does have a servicing plan. And frankly, you know, they've got something up front. I don't mean just a servicing plan, right? I mean, you know, what are your security practices up front? And what's a servicing model? Are you marketing differently so that it's proper separation so it's outside. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, then you can put in the threat model that, hey, we don't trust this thing, so it's off in this sandbox somewhere else. Actually, so that's a brilliant example. So in the end, when we're building index server in the early days, so don't be nuts, so index server has these things called word practice. And what they do is they'll take a document type. Actually, it's a killer example. Thanks, Joe. So it, it, we, we can actually basically parse. Well, actually, index server knows nothing. All it sees is a, is a series of tags. That's all it sees. We have these word crackers. And the crack will say, let's say, let's say uh, take a PDF file. We don't ship that, right? It comes from third parties. Or make up this, I don't know. But in the old days, it didn't. And so it would crawl over PDF files. It would provide back to index server a stream of, essentially, metadata. The problem was, we have no, we have index server that has to run an elevator privilege the reason it runs elevated is because it has to know when any file changes so it knows when to re-index it, right? The only way you can do that is by having um, what's called a volume handle. The only way you can get a volume handle in Windows is if you are an admin. So index server has to run ad as admin. But you're going to run some untrusted word cracker that's parsing complex data, right? Are you going to run that in admin context? Really? Some code you do not know? That is doing really complex stuff. No. So the index server guys, what they did is they broke the index server into two big chunks. CID daemon.exe and some other one. But the other one runs in low privilege. Very low privilege. There's a whole bunch of other gobbledygook we do as well, which makes it very close to the IE Chrome Adobe Acrobat sandbox. So what we do is we load those word cracker DLLs into this process, this low process. We index server says, hey, that file has changed, go and index it. Then it indexes it and sends a stream of text back in a well-documented format that is clean. And you're not, the index server is doing no parsing at this point. It's not parsing PDF files. There's a good example, right? It was re-architected. And actually, another good example. So Blaster, the reason why Blaster was successful, it was actually a vulnerability in a DCOM, um, remote, uh, remote DCOM activation. But it goes to all this RPC code. Now, those of you who look carefully at Windows XP Service Pack 1 and Windows XP Service Pack 2, you'll see that the RPCSS service that does RPC work was broken up from being one service running in system context to two processes. One running in system context, which is the DCOM activation, which is not used that often, 
And the other one was RP, the core RPCSS, it does a remote digital marshalling. It runs as, as a network service. Again, we broke the two apart. See, Joe's absolutely right. In some cases, it makes absolute sense to say, you know what, we, we, can't, we can't do this. We're going to break it and re-architect. That may take time. But we'll at least get the plans on the drawing board. <laughs> oh, where was it? Oh, that's right. Um, security does not need to be secure. Um, just throwing a bucket load of security software and a security problem may not actually help that much. Um, one of the first bugs that we shipped in Windows Vista was a bug in Windows Defender. <laughs> um, I mean, and the problem is our fuzzers actually. The problem is our, well, no, the problem is the code. Um, our fuzzers didn't, and, and, but actually the crazy thing was, right, so Windows Defender, it was the most fuzzed product at Microsoft at the time we shipped. Like, here's you know, Windows Defender's stats, here's like the closest competitor, but we still missed it. So the point I'm making here is just adding another layer of complexity, another layer of defense, doesn't necessarily help. You can't essentially fix cruddy software, insecure software, just by putting some other layer in front of it that probably has a vulnerability in it as well at some point. Um, I saw this with other products at Microsoft where they wanted to pass some funky stars, they put a layer of defense in front of it, I code reviewed it and found bugs. These are the very, very early days. Well, the answer was put another layer of defense in front. No. Get the code right, get the designs right. You may not need that extra layer of defense in front. You'll never reach perfection. Um, the, the point here is you will never get to zero security vulnerabilities. You just won't. Um, as long as attackers are you know, drawing breath, they're going to find ways around things. It's just the nature of the game. It's like a chess game. You make a move, they make a move. Make a move, they make another move. And sometimes you make a really good move that keeps them confounded for a few for, for a while. Um, I think we substantially raised the bar in Windows, but then we substantially raised the bar again in Windows 7. We'll do the same moving forward, we'll keep doing that. But we're not in any way, shape, or form going to think we're going to get to zero vulnerabilities. It's just not going to happen. It's, it's very asymmetric. Right? The attacker has all the advantage here. The attacker can spend as long as he wants doing as much research as he wants in. in in the dark, and then finally strike when they want. And as a defender, you've got to try and get all things right all the time. You know, you've got to try and ship software that's secure, that's reliable, it's compatible, it's manageable, it's supportable, it's affordable, blah, 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 and ship it on budget on time. Whereas the attacker doesn't have none of those constraints. They can do whatever they want, whenever they want. It's just the nature of the game, it's the way it is. So the whole point here is. That you've, got to, you've got to imagine this. Now, I'm not, I'm not making this as an excuse. So we'll say, well, you still have some security vulnerabilities. Yep, we do. So, and it will and it'll never get to zero. But the whole point here is you've got to realize that. Do the very best you possibly can, but realize you'll never get to zero. And part of the reason why I say this, I think in part, it's so easy to lose heart and say, oh, another vulnerability. It's so easy to just go, I'm just going to throw my hands and give up. No, just keep, keep doing it. Keep doing what you're doing. And eventually the attackers will start going somewhere else because your stuff will become harder and harder to, harder to exploit successfully. What's that? Adobe. Don't split mics up, lawyers. I didn't say anything. <laughs> I'm not repeating what you said. Um, but yeah, the attackers go elsewhere. They're finding things harder and harder and harder on your platform or your stuff. And so they'll go elsewhere. It may take time, but it happens. Trust me. Um, which leads me quite nicely to the next topic. I, I think I spend, when I look at the SDL requirements that I work on, I think 70% of them are defenses. 20% um, are sort of getting the code right and the designs right. Another 10%, I don't know what that 10% is, but 70% is working on defenses, which is basically saying, you know what, there are bugs that we don't know about. What, how, how is your product going to defend itself in the face of an onslaught that you don't know about yet? And this is why you have to have extra defenses in the code. This is why Adobe is now shipping Acrobat in the sandbox. This is why we ship IEA. 
with a sandbox. This is why Chrome ships with a sandbox. This is why we require all binaries at Microsoft ship with address space like memorization built in. This is why we require all executable binaries at Microsoft be shipped with NX Compact turned on. This is why we require um, web properties to use anti-XSS. Uh, anti, uh, this is why we require database servers to deny access to all underlying tables and only grant access through store procedures. These are all defenses because we know there's going to be a bug somewhere. This is why we require the use of new compilers because they add defenses by default. These are all extra defenses that you should be thinking about. And this is why the SDL is so hard and so <laughs> intense about making sure people in include. If, if, if you were given you know, a finance amount of time and said you always focus on just one thing, getting the code right or adding excellent, excellent defenses, I would focus on the defenses because you're never going to get the code right. You're going you're to prevent or help reduce the chance that your customers or your users will be compromised. And we see this time and time and time again. Here's one of my favorites from earlier this year. It was a zero day in IE. If you go from Windows 2000 Explorer, Windows Explorer, Windows Explorer 6 it goes from being exploitable, red, critical, and as we get down to newer versions of IE and newer versions of the OS, look, a bit of yellow in the middle, and finally turns green. Why? Look for the bug is still there. You go from being a slam dunk, no brainer, get remote code execution, drive by a website attack, to the, 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 the exploit won't work. Your, your, your browser will crash. But the coding bug was still there. I love, we see this time and time and time again. Now, one thing I'd love to see is more of, but we're starting to see this as well, which is not affected, not affected. But I'm still happy by this. It still, it still shows products. It shows that we are working diligently on adding more and more defenses um, to the OS, and essentially protecting customers from exploits. My last slide, which I kind of alluded to earlier on, is today's DOS is tomorrow's remote code execution. We've been bitten by this so many times. And I think the industry as a whole has been bitten by this where we think, oh, but you know, there's these constraints and you know, it's not going to happen. You, you, this is just, it's just going to be a DOS. I mean, how many, how many times have you heard a Noldy reference up until like mid last year that a Noldy reference was not exploitable? Turns out, no, you know, if I told you two years ago a Noldy reference is exploitable on Linux, you would have laughed. You would, you would have laughed me out of the room. Now I can show you slam dunk working exploits. But uh, okay, I want to show a hint. How many of you would have thought two years ago, seriously, that a Noldy reference was, a, was a, at worst a denial of service? At worst. Okay, how many of you are like, what the hell is a Noldy reference? <laughs> 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 okay. um, anyway, the point here is there's you know, an old saying that came you know, from the government, you know, tax, and they get better, right? They don't get worse. So when you say that we're not fixing this bug because of blah, 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 may not be true tomorrow. But basically what you're saying is we're not fixing this bug because I have a crystal ball. And that crystal ball will tell me everything in the future. I'll be frank, if you've got that crystal ball, you should be down the racetrack. No one can predict. The number of times at Microsoft where we have said that's not exploitable, luckily we never we don't even, don't even have these conversations anymore. That's not exploitable. How many times have we been right? Exactly zero. Because the moment you say it's not exploitable, it's like a red rag to a ball. There's always someone out there saying, I want to prove that's exploitable. And attacks only get better. You look at these, um, this DLL planting issue, right? David and I documented that. We put everything, the whole nine yards, in writing secure code. Everything, including the fix. That was eight years ago. Well, even then we said, this is a local network at best, or at worst, a local network only attack. Enter web down. Now use web down as an attack vector. That the environment changed. So you can't assume these things. So we, the, the lesson here: be very, very careful about hunting bugs, because either you don't know enough about it, or your assumptions may be nebulous at best. So, quick wrap up. Um, 
it's funny, I actually pulled a whole bunch out, because uh, I realized I only had an hour. Um, there's a lot more I wanted to add. Uh, so I'll add one more, actually. Um, but this is not really something that I've learned. I've learned through other people. How many of you remember the famous Debian random number debacle? Okay, so basically someone ran a tool, dial grind. Ah, oh, this is an uninitialized variable, an uninitialized pointer. That's bad. Therefore, I'll make it initialized. Turns out that was worse because that pointer was used as a source of entropy for the random number generator. So basically, the random number generator in Debian will produce really random numbers between 0 and 32k, which was made, which, and the problem was there was a lot of SSL private keys generated with that random number generator. That's where the problem starts. Just generating random numbers is bad enough. But when you have long-lived random numbers like private keys, then it's really, really bad. So the lesson there, which came from Ben Laurie, who works in the OpenSSL team by the Apache group in the UK, he made a comment which is so true. Never fix a bug you don't understand. <laughs> and it's so damn true.